What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here, what we do on Unfortunate Ends is talk about people who have had tragic or unfortunate ends to their life. If you're interested in this type of content, make sure to subscribe as I upload it every single Friday. And anyway, I hope you enjoy. And let's get into the video. Duchess Elizabeth had a happy childhood. Yet this would all change following her marriage to the Emperor of Austria, Franz Joseph. Sadly, she didn't fit in at the Imperial Court at Vienna, and her life was filled with the loss of loved ones and tragic events, including one which would lead to her untimely death. The woman who would one day become the Empress of Austria was born in Munich in southern Germany on the 24th of December 1837, as Elizabeth Amelie Eugene. She was the third child and second daughter of a Duke of Bavaria, Maximilian Joseph, a prince of the Bavarian royal household of Wittelsbach, and his wife, Princess Ludovica. One thing to note about her father was that he was eccentric. For instance, a year after Elizabeth's birthday, he undertook an extended trip through the Middle East, during the course of which he engaged in some memorable behaviour. Not least, climbing the Great Pyramid at Giza outside Cairo in Egypt, where he had his servants yodel while he was performing the ascent. As a result, the home life of Elizabeth or Cece as she was known to her family, was relatively informal when she was growing up, a stark contrast with her later adult life in Vienna. In 1853, when she was just 15 years of age, a marriage was arranged between Elizabeth and her cousin, Franz Joseph of the House of Habsburg, at that time 22 years of age, and since 1848, the Emperor of Austria and King of Hungary, Croatia and Bohemia. The couple were married on the 24th of April 1854, at the Augustinian Church in the Austrian capital of Vienna. Thus, at just 16 years of age, the Duchess Elizabeth of Bavaria became the Empress of Austria and Queen of Hungary, Croatia and Bohemia, a conglomerate which would become the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1867. Yet, Elizabeth did not adapt well to life at the Habsburg court. It was ruled by an overt formality and ceremony, which was very different to the world she had grown up in. Moreover, the imperial couple had to contend with the constant presence of Franz Joseph's domineering mother, the Archduchess Sophie. This disillusionment was compounded when Elizabeth quickly bore their first child, a girl also named Sophie after her grandmother, whose rearing the elder Archduchess entrusted to a wet nurse. To compound matters, the younger Sophie died in 1857, just weeks after her second birthday, almost certainly from typhus contracted during a royal visit to Hungary. It was the first of many heartbreaks for the Empress, and her second daughter, Gisela, who had been born the previous year in 1856, had also been taken away from her mother following her birth, and raised away from her parents. In 1858, a son and heir to the imperial throne was born. This was Crown Prince Rudolf, and he was raised in the same way as his sister. Then a fourth and final child, Marie Valerie was eventually born in 1868, though by then, Elizabeth was strong-willed enough to demand that the child was raised in her household, and as a result, the Empress became particularly close to her youngest child. Life at the Habsburg court throughout the years was mixed for Elizabeth, the Emperor was evidently very much in love with his wife, who was famed as one of the great beauties of Europe's royal and imperial courts, but it was a largely unrequited affection. Elizabeth seems to have never fully forgiven Franz Joseph for allowing himself to be dominated by his mother, and as a result, having had their children to be raised away from the couple. She also increasingly shirked her imperial duties preferring to spend her time reading, writing and exercising, with the gymnasiums being installed in several of the imperial residences for her use. Elizabeth possessed a keen intellect, and felt her time was wasted when it was spent trapped in the formalities of the court at Vienna. Her excuse for not attending such events was often that she was ill, and indeed, the Empress was experiencing increasingly poor health in the 1860s. Ailments which at one time led her physicians to fear that she was suffering from tuberculosis. 
She also engaged in philanthropic activity, for instance, seeking to establish charitable institutions and asylums for the mentally unwell in Vienna in the 1870s, a highly progressive measure in a city which was soon to acquire a reputation as the birthplace of psychoanalysis. Moreover, the Empress was a frequent traveller during the 1870s and 1880s, developing a particular affinity for Greece, where she had built a palace on the island of Corfu, named the Achilleion after Achilles, the hero of Homer's Iliad. Some of these travels aroused suspicion, notably frequent visits to Hungary which led more than one contemporary to speculate that the Empress was engaged in an extramarital affair with Gaunt Gujula Andrassy. This man was the Prime Minister of Hungary between 1867 and 1871, and the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Austria-Hungary from 1871 until 1879. On more than one occasion, Elizabeth strongly defended Andrassy's political movements in Hungary to her husband, and advocated promoting him to become the Prime Minister of Hungary. Yet, there seems little substantive evidence to indicate that Elizabeth and the Hungarian Count were ever engaged in any sort of relationship. Throughout the 1870s and 1880s, Elizabeth also became the subject of considerable media interest throughout Europe, the Empress of Austria-Hungary being identified as an eccentric character as a result of her exercise regime and travels. Because of this, Elizabeth tried to travel in secret whenever she could, and used a number of aliases. In 1889, tragedy struck the imperial family. On the morning of the 30th of January that year, Elizabeth's only son and the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Crown Prince Rudolf, was found dead, along with his mistress, Baroness Mary von Witsera, in his quarters at a hunting lodge at Mailing, just outside Vienna. Subsequent investigations determined that the two had died as a result of a murder-suicide pact, although an attempted cover-up by the Habsburg government in the days that followed clouded the event with suspicion for many years to come. Rudolf, like his mother, was a retiring, melancholy figure, who had also found the ritual and formality of the court in Vienna stifling, and there seems little doubt that he did take his own life in early 1889. His death broke the direct line of succession in the empire, and Franz Joseph's brother, Archduke Karl Ludwig, now became the successor to the imperial title. In the immediate aftermath of Rudolf's death, Elizabeth became increasingly disillusioned with life at the imperial court. She had never been happy there, and her son's death was compounded for Elizabeth by the death of her father the previous year in 1888, and then the death of her mother in 1892. She drifted into depression in the early 1890s, largely only being seen dressed in black now in public. Always a distant figure at court, she became even more reclusive, spending much of the 1890s travelling throughout Europe, notably protracted stints at the palace she had built on the island of Corfu. She also travelled to North Africa and the Middle East, an oddity for a largely unaccompanied senior royal in the late 19th century. Despite their separation though, she maintained a regular correspondence with her husband during these years, and there is evidence from these letters that they shared a closeness which was perhaps born of the mutual suffering of two unhappy lives and having lost two of their four children. Yet, the tragic events which plagued the Empress's life would continue. The manner in which the Empress was assassinated was largely the product of happenstance. In 1898, as part of her ongoing travels, she visited Switzerland and was in the city of Geneva on the 10th of September. It was a fateful coincidence that she was here at the same time as her eventual murderer, one Luigi Lugeni. Lugeni was an Italian who was born in 1873 and who had been through various orphanage and foster homes in his youth. In the 1890s, he had served in the military for some time, work which brought him to Switzerland, where he befriended several anarchists in the town of Lausanne. It was owing to his growing ideological belief in anarchism, a major current of the 19th century European political thought, 
that he travelled to Geneva in 1898 with the explicit goal of murdering any sovereign or member of a European ruling dynasty as an expression of his political beliefs. It was pure coincidence that the Empress Elizabeth happened to be in Geneva at that time, and this misfortunate timing was to lead to her death. In the early afternoon on the 10th of September, the Empress left her hotel in Geneva with her lady-in-waiting, Countess Irma Sturey, in order to catch a steamship to Montreux. Shortly after 1.30pm, they encountered Lugeni. The Italian had originally intended to assassinate Philippe, the Duke of Orléans, and a claimant to the French throne, but the French aristocrat had left Geneva before Lugeni could execute his plan. Accordingly, shortly before 2pm on the streets of Geneva, Lugeni stabbed the Empress Elizabeth with a sharpened industrial file above her left breast. Lugeni then fled the scene. The Empress did not die immediately, rather, her lady-in-waiting and some nearby pedestrians helped her onto the steamship. She quickly lost consciousness here and was proclaimed dead at 10 minutes past 2 in the afternoon. An autopsy afterwards determined that the file Lugeni had stabbed her with had pierced one of her lungs and penetrated her heart. She was 60 years old at the time of her death. Lugeni was apprehended shortly after fleeing the scene of the assassination, and the following day, the murder weapon was located. Yet strangely, the Italian was disappointed to discover that the death penalty had been abolished in the canton of Geneva, and that he would now not be executed for his crime, a punishment he had hoped would establish him as an anarchist martyr. Instead, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. He would serve 12 years at the Avesha prison in Geneva, during which time he composed his memoirs. In October 1910, he hung himself in his cell. The Empress's death was not without its own political consequences. An international conference for the social defence against anarchists was quickly convened in Rome towards the end of November 1898. 54 delegates attended from 21 countries. Each agreed to set up state surveillance services to monitor the activities of anarchist movements within their own jurisdictions and to share information on these organisations where they were operating across borders. It was also agreed to clamp down on anarchist literature and news outlets and that henceforth the death penalty would be imposed on anyone like Lugeni who engaged in assassination of a ruling dynast. Thus, the Empress Elizabeth's murder in 1898 had a historical significance for the future of the anarchist movement in Europe and beyond at the dawn of the 20th century. In the aftermath of her assassination, her body was carried back to Vienna, where she was interred in the Imperial Crypt on the 17th of September. Her life has since been the subject of numerous plays, films, TV series, and several works of literature, not least an unpublished story by Mark Twain, who wrote about her murder entitled The Memorable Assassination. Thank you so much for watching the video of Empress Elizabeth of Austria. I hope you guys enjoyed, and if you did, make sure to like and subscribe. I hope you have notifications turned on so you get all my videos as soon as they're uploaded. And if you have any suggestions, you can leave them down below in the comments or in the description. There are links to my Instagram and email, which you can also send me a message so I can look at um, any recommendations. And anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next unfortunate end. Thanks.